not have to visit there. At the end of the day, you are truly loved. By our word. And as always, we welcome any questions that you may have. You can submit them at questions at truedivinity.com. Again, at truedivinity.com. Also, if you are on social media, please follow us on Instagram at The Path is Narrow for quotes, affirmation, and inspiration. So, without further ado, we'll have our talk. Today's topic is down the rabbit hole. Get us down the rabbit hole. So the rabbit hole is a idiom or metaphor that we hear used all the time, especially let's say in common years when we're doing research and Next thing you know, we come across something interesting and we start to deter or from the path that we're on to go deeper and explore the idea that had sparked our curiosity. Um, and oftentimes it leads, us, it leads us on this long path where we tend to absorb uh, a lot of knowledge, good or bad, just absorbing a lot of content. Uh, and interesting experiences. Uh, the, the origin of that idea of the rabbit hole comes from Wonderland. A lot of people are familiar with that, and a lot of people are not, uh, just because it's become such a part of today's slang that you know you can hear it and not know its origin or its its true meaning. Um, why you see it in Alice in Wonderland, it was also present in The Matrix, which referenced Alice in Wonderland, where they went and found Neo in his normal job in the office in this big world and told him to follow the White Rabbit, which is exactly what uh, Alice in Wonderland uh, did. And so looking at the scenario, what it means to go down this rabbit hole. As we go through class, it will it will all connect and make sense to you. Uh, but starting with that concept and thinking of Alice being this young lady, young girl, in fact, who was uh, near a home in a forest close by kind of going through her daily routine until she sees this rabbit who is in a hurry to go somewhere. Uh, that rabbit goes and runs into this tree down into this rabbit hole. And so Alice being sparked by where this rabbit was going in such a hurry begins to follow after him to figure out where is he going. And she's curious about what what is it that is so important that has this rabbit so frantic. And so she interrupts her day and her path to go and follow the path of this white rabbit. And what she finds when she gets there is that the hole is very small. And so for her to get down in and through the door where the rabbit went into what she would soon find as Wonderland is she has to shrink herself right, in order for her to be able to go on that journey to be exposed or to discover this new world, whatever this rabbit is headed that is so important. And so she shrinks herself and ultimately she makes it through with no sign of the rabbit. And she goes through this world, which is nothing. 
nothing like the world she's used to or the world that she comes from. There's a lot of things that are changed. The animals are different. The conversation is different. The culture of the place uh, is totally different. And one of the biggest experiences she has when she's down the rabbit hole um, is she runs into um, this unbirthday party. Um, and it's a tea party with the Mad Hatter and the March Hare. And it's a tea party in which it makes no sense. Uh, the rules are backwards and they're celebrating the unbirthday, which is they make this huge justification for celebrating all the days outside of your actual birthday, that those are the real days to be celebrated. Um, and so you see a lot of weird, quirky things happen and Alice says, you know, this is stupid, and she continues on her path. Um, and to think about the process even up to this point, when we are sparked, and most people on this call, if you're on this call and have been on it consistently, uh, then you are a truth seeker. You are looking for something. It's not as obvious that it's not apparent that is not just widespread in public society. Um, and that's something that we focus on and, and pride ourselves in is, be able, is, is being able to reveal that non-obvious wisdom that you can take and apply to your life uh, for the better. One that'll bring you closer to God, but also will make you wiser in your personal affairs your, your business affairs, and most importantly, the spiritual affair. Um, and so, considering that, right, when you come here, there is this process of the shrinking of yourself, the shrinking of the ego to be able to get small enough to come into a space that is unfamiliar but for you not to immediately reject it, but to listen with an open ear and open heart. And that can create, again, a very positive outcome and help you unlock the potential to really learning some useful knowledge uh, that is hidden. In the Proverbs, that God is known for concealing, I think, because it is up to us to prove you are work through our works we have proved worthy of certain wisdom and certain knowledge uh, but there's also another side where we can tend to be distracted and the rabbit that we follow doesn't lead us to a place um, that we really are learning and growing and getting useful wisdom for our lives. Sometimes it just we kind of get lost in the distraction. And one thing in Alice's journey through the rabbit hole, though she encountered these very strange circumstances, like the upper that parted, she was never stuck at them. And she never stayed to the point to where she allowed herself to become a part of uh, that madness. But a lot of us spend more time entrapped in ideas, things that whether society pushed on us, family pushed on us, or we just had a late night search on the internet uh, and we start to get attached to these ideas and lose sight of the purpose, which is to figure out or find what is most important. Right? And once you recognize and already know that that is God and becoming closer to that relationship and informing yourself, then you do things and work to get to that place where you are as close to God as possible, where you are as evolved as 
reform that's possible. But in order to get there, you do have to go through the journey of encountering these very, you know, strange things. And as you become enlightened, then you start to realize how strange the things that are actually normal are. So it, it, it gets you to a point where you question kind of what where what am I following? Where am I going? Which is why we always talk about how important it is for us to take time to audit and review and think about and reflect why we are where we are today and where we're headed. Just picking back on our last talk around vision, just making sure that we haven't allowed ourselves to get clouded by the distractions especially being that there are so many now in today's society that we can tend to uh, forget what we're following. Get sidetracked and we get stuck in these backwards ways because we never reviewed it. We just went ahead and went along with the flow and now our lives that we're sitting here at this party of madness and we think that it is normal not realizing that sometimes we allow ourselves to be a part of things that are perverse, but are cloaked as though they are something that is good, something that is righteous, something that serves us well or connects us to you know, something that we care about. But a lot of times that is the deception that Wonderland was this place where it was filled with levels of deception. There were illusions, right? And the biggest antagonist, and it was the Queen of Hearts, who was this tyrant, wanted to, who did rule kind of with an iron fist, and was quick to execute, uh, or at least condemn people to execution. But ultimately, people never really got executed, they got away. Uh, so it showed that there was a lack of substance there, that it was just pure illusion. Um, and so thinking about life and recognizing some of the things that are pure illusion when you chase the right rather that it tends to lead you on a journey to kind of get to the origin of things so that you know that whatever you practice today in society, you have an idea of what it actually comes from, so that then you can judge appropriately whether you should be practicing or living that way in the first place. If, again, your goal is to be closer to God, you believe in scripture, you believe, you know, in the power and the truth, then that type of study is necessary. Right? So we think about this time period where we are today uh, for those of you who are honoring and celebrating it uh, happy Passover happy Passover uh, because this is the time period of the Passover and it is something that has kind of gotten out of the practice of many people who do hold the Bible dear and consider it uh, the authority as it relates to scripture in their lives, but there is no recognition of the Passover anymore. It has been substituted for something else. But in understanding the Passover and even understanding the walk of Jesus, then you would know that Passover is something that Jesus kept and was highly devout to and in practicing. Uh, and even on the symbolic side of it, his resurrection process occurred during the Passover, right? And so when we think about the Passover in the first place, <clears throat> which is in the book of Exodus chapter 12, which we're not going to read through, but I will summarize here, um, in which in Exodus 12, it is the story of the Israelites at the beginning of their exodus out of Egypt. 
So this is where Moses has gotten the truth, come back from the desert, and is preparing to lead Israel out of the bondage of Egypt. To lead Israel out of the bondage of Egypt. And so when you hear Passover, it was mandatory for all of the people who were Israel who were currently in bondage in Egypt to remove the leaven, which is an agent that is added to food for it to rise, like yeast, uh, baking soda. And they were required to move these things out of their homes, as well as to sacrifice a lamb to paint their doors with the blood or their posts, sorry, excuse me, their side posts with the blood to demonstrate that they are a part of Israel because there was a plague coming to Egypt to smite the firstborn and it was going to destroy the animals as well as the firstborn children. And so Israel goes through the process of cleaning out their homes. Concept of spring cleaning, no coincidence. They go into their homes, remove these leather, these agents out of the house, only to leave what is known as unleavened bread. And so there's a symbolism in the scripture around leaven, where leaven is what the wicked priests again, metaphorically used, which is when they mix kind of false teachings into real teachings to puff up the story or the scripture to make it more entertaining or to make it more believable or just to make it more palatable, right? So they may dumb it down, right? Because we think of unleavened bread, it's not as pleasant. It's crispy, it's like a cracker almost, but it's really crispy not too much you can do to it from a flavor perspective. But leaven is when you can create, you can create bread, you can create your, you know, focaccia rolls, and, uh, create all types of you know, non-bread, all of these different flavorful breads that are kind of more puffy, they're more soft, they're easier to chew, they're more enjoyable, they're hot, they're, when you go into a bakery and you smell and get that type of kind of hypnotic experience around bread that we tend to get when we walk into uh, bakeries or smell fresh things in the oven. That is what leaven helps that to do, to make it more pleasurable. And so the point of the Passover and removing that out, on one side it was, because it takes a while for them to prepare anything with leather. So they needed to get rid of it so that when they ran through the desert to escape Egypt, there was no holdup. They had the unleavened bread, which they could snack on and eat and keep moving and not be captured by the cavalry that would chase them through the desert. But then on the other side, it was a matter of kind of sticking to the truth and holding to God, removing all of the thoughts, removing all of the stuff that may have come to them by way of living in Egypt, you know, by way of their own personal beliefs, but just cleansing that out and just total commitment, right? And so ultimately the plague happens because Israel goes through these steps. They don't lose their firstborn and they're able to escape while the Egyptians are going crazy because they have been struck by the plague. And so now this is when Israel escapes through the desert and descends down into the valley to make it through the Red Sea. And ultimately, they go on and establish the nation that lives for God. Now, while that is a more literal interpretation of the story, it is also something for us to know why it's important to keep the Passover, because it's important for us to remember and to know that, you know, before we began to care about God 
not enough. If you seek after the truth and to change our ways and reform, we were too in bondage, in Egyptian bondage. The bondage of our own desires, the bondage of our lower selves, the bondage of societal expectations, the family expectations, we allow those things to keep us enslaved until we decide to cleanse out and to prepare to move forward, break free and escape out of that bondage. So it's incredible for us to always remember that. Uh, and, it, and it's always good to know and when this time comes around in the year, it's great to keep. So when we think about fast forward and you look at the process that Jesus goes through with the resurrection, right? there was a similar process as far as Jesus having to break free of the bondage of flesh right? so that the resurrection could happen where you know, Jesus is reborn a spirit. And again, that is very metaphorical and it's something for us all to take in in a way that we, the same, have to over and over again shed the bondage of flesh because it happens in moments, but not some big event. We have holy days to remind us of the events and to kind of keep our lives in context, like an annual check. But there is no one time. There's a constant overcoming and a constant rebirth to us as we navigate, as we grow and evolve and kind of shed old ways and shed the old sins born again in the spirit and living through that Christ. And this is no, this isn't a huge separation from the Passover, because if you get connect the symbols, what was the blood uh, that was spread on the post of the homes in Israel? It was a lamb. Many gospel songs, as well as in certain Bible verses, Jesus is referred to as a lamb. And, his, and that sacrifice of him putting his life on the line for the sake of spreading truth is a direct connection to the Passover in which they sacrificed the lamb and the blood and the blood is spread on the homes for protection, as is the interpretation that is a you know a bit kind of turned and twisted, but through the sacrifice and through the living of those principles beyond the death of Jesus, there is a level of protection. And there's even in Ephesians, they speak about it pretty plainly in that process, and some people may have heard about it in church. Um, but in that process of resurrection, when Jesus is making the sacrifice, similar to the process of when Israel has to go down and through the desert and encounter all types of troubles and then chased by Calvary, and uh, it was a form of hell. There's a to actually a very struggle. You're hoping to make it on the other side, but during this process in these days of Israel escaping captivity, you know, it was a very difficult and dark time, eating a leaven bread, always on the go in haste. Well, there's also that talk of that process where they talk about how Jesus has to go down into what they say as the lower parts of the earth, uh, which some people like to say that it is hell, or, uh, but that's 
actually not what the scriptures say when you think about the lower parts of the earth and the body being earth, a representation of the earth. Jesus having to go into the lower depth of himself so that he can then ascend. Like in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 9 and 10, it says, Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heaven, that he might feel all things. And so when you remember certain stories about Jesus and him being tempted and crying at his death and, and being afraid of sacrifice and the doubt that he put out towards God, there's a journey of him going down to the lower parts of himself uh, where the fear exists, right? Where the doubt exists. And despite the big character that Jesus has, that did not, he was not uh, immune from going down into those lower parts of himself, that lower part of, uh, of an experience where it was a form of hell for him. That experience was ultimately so that he could then ascend once he made it through that struggle with himself. And it was the same thing with the Passover where Israel made it through the struggle of the fear and the doubt of being chased and worried about being recaptured and having to go through a red sea where Moses split the sea and they go through and again it being this metaphoric struggle of escaping the bondage of yourself, escaping the bondage of certain pressures, escaping uh, the, the bondage of that those lower aspects of yourself or of society. Uh, and so in order to do that, there are these dark moments that we go through where we feel lonely, where it's trying and it's difficult right, to do the right thing and to follow the truth despite how the world especially in today's world where distractions are everywhere the propaganda is everywhere but when you have that guide that, that truth and that you are committed to that don't get entrapped by those illusions, even though you may end up entertaining them for a moment or two. You don't get entrapped and you can't allow yourself to be entrapped by that. Just because the world does it does not make it okay. Just because it becomes popular does not mean that it is the truth. It can literally be just as backwards as you know it. There is a such thing as a mass psychosis. Most people like to isolate. If one individual is different, then the individual must be crazy. But there are mass groups that can become crazy, especially in society if the leaders push them and indirectly and passive aggressively force them to take on practices uh, because every time they open a newspaper ad there, every time you click on a video, an advertisement pops up, you go in the grocery store and the decorations are everywhere. So this must be normal. This must be the way of life. And the key is to go to the schools and now there are these pressures that push you to live life a certain way that may have absolutely nothing to do with truth or have nothing to do with the spiritual journey that you're on and where you're looking to go with your life, the level that you want to evolve to. And so it's important to have holy days and have these things to help you. While it's Sabbath day again, it's so beautiful to have these moments of reflection, to be able to check yourself, to be able to have a level of counsel to help you, again, sort through and start to organize your life to ensure that the things that you do, 
the things that you practice, the things that you live are actually things that will help you get where it is that you're working to go and not you being distracted or deterred off into some you know, nonsense that's located in a, in a rabbit hole. You know, um, it's interesting because tradition is and has been uh, a rabbit hole uh, that many of us have never questioned. And when you think about the rabbits, you think about the eggs, both of them occupy a special place in the hearts and minds of so many people during Easter, right? And they are seen as a symbol of rebirth and renewal and have been used as very special symbols for the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which we know there's no connection. However, you know, when you think about the history, there's no secret that under the Roman Empire, Christianity did this a lot. They adopted the pagan rituals of conquered people in an effort to help convert them, right? And so what they saw over time is that it worked very well, right? It allowed the people who were conquered to continue observing and remembering their days. So it gave this outward appearance when their whole other reality was happening. And what they saw with time, the population would be replaced, would be replaced with people who were adopting the new tradition. But the problem with this is that it never really faded because what we see today and mostly all the holidays, the mix of paganism, mixed in them all. But with Easter, it definitely is the same case because uh, you have uh, the Easter bunny and the Easter eggs, honey, right? And to most, it seems harmless like believing in Santa Claus. But it's not harmless, right? They actually have a significant association with pagan worship and rituals from the past. And when you examine the name Easter, one important fact is that Easter never associated with Jesus in the original scripture, right? Mm -hmm. You can't find Easter and Jesus being used together in any shape, form, or fashion. It's actually derived from the word yoster, which is spelled E-O-S-T-R-E. E-O-S-T-R-E. And yoster was the queen, was Queen Samarimus. Right? And Queen Samarimus was the wife of Nimrod. Right? And Nimrod was Noah's evilly progressive great grandson. And you can see that in Genesis chapter 10, verses 6 to 8. Now, Nimrod, which was Joseph's husband, built major cities like Babel and Ashar and uh, Neve and, and Kalau. And and look at Genesis 10, 10 to 12. And all these uh, uh, major cities were known for their evil and unimaginable worship practices and perversion. So you're talking about a very evil place, all of these cities that Nimrod, who was the husband of Yoster, developed. And after Nimrod's death, Queen Samarimus, which is Yoster, kept these evil practices alive by uh, worshiping and treating her husband uh, Nimrod as a sun god and making it mandatory for all of the people in, uh, in the cities to do so. So she also gave birth uh, to an illegitimate son named Tammuz, and that's T-A-M-M-U-Z. But uh, in the process of her having this illegitimate child, she convinced the people that her son was supernaturally conceived. 
And so the people, by believing this, worship to Moses as a reincarnation of his father, or excuse me, a reincarnation of Nimrod. Um, but then they also not only worship him, they worship the queen as the mother goddess. And all of this is important for you to understand as we continue. It's all leading up to this very special thing in your mind. Now, there was a lot of false religions and satanic worships, uh, worshiping uh, that were practiced during these times. You had human sacrifices, uh, you had idolatry, you had astrology, you name it, right? And all of these were in honor and praise of Nimrod and Yoster, right? And after the Tower of Babel, we all hear about that in Genesis 7, um, verse, verse 7, right? All these people were dispersed throughout the world. So as a result, you have people that resettled in different lands. And they took these paganistic worshiping practices to these different places. And so Queen Samaritus, which was Yoster, came to be known as Astera, uh, in the Anglo-Saxon goddess, right, for rebirth and the day of new life in spring, right? Known also as Astartes in uh, the Phoenician goddess of the moon. And so, so many different names, the wife of Baal, the queen of the heavens, right? And Nimrod had other names like Baal, Baal, Malek, right? The god of fire, the great life giver, right? And then if anybody gets serious and they study the Old Testament, you will see how God had hatred towards these places and specifically, even individuals like Tammuz, the son of uh, of Yoster. And when you go to Ezekiel chapter eight, verse fourteen, he speaks of that. He speaks of Tammuz and how the abomination of those who worship him, and also the other things that they did. And so, when we think about this origin of Easter, right? The beginning of Easter goes back to the springtime ritual begun by Queen Samaras following the death of her son, right? And there's so many different legends and folk tales told around that, but those things spread, right? And with the spread of Christianity many years later, uh, it was a common practice to adapt the existing non-Christian festivals and assimilate them into the Christian philosophy, right? All because of this Queen Samarius. And Queen Samarius was seen and known again as the goddess of spring and her symbolism her symbolism dealt with the renewal and the rebirth. And the Christians belief in the resurrection of Christ that well. So this is where you start getting this this kind of running parallel this, this likeness of Easter and Jesus all mixed in together. And so today, American history teaches us that Easter was dismissed as a pagan holiday by the nation's founding Puritans. And then it did not begin to be observed widely until after the Civil War. Again, this is important for you to understand because you have been given something that you may not understand the origin of, and that you fight so, 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 uh, so big, vigorously about and argue over. Um, so when we think about these these Easter eggs and these Easter baskets, it takes us back to the Babylonians, who considered the egg as a sacred symbol that represented again, uh, Asteria or Yoster. Again, fertility and new life. And this was symbolic to the 28-day cycles of the moon and also a woman's menstrual cycle, right? And so the Babylonians believed in a fable about a huge egg that fell from the heavens uh, in the Euphrates River, which was attached to Queen Samarius. And then the egg dying was observed, evil ritual celebrating the, the spring equinox. But the interesting thing about this egg dying is that they used the blood of children in order to dye these eggs. 
Now, this must may seem extreme to some, but if you do your research, you'll see for yourself. Now, uh, we're talking about paganistic rituals. We're talking about satanic worship. Uh, we're not talking about what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. We're talking about those uh, who live a different type of life and see the world differently, how they practice. So it may be outside of what you can conceive in your mind, and it should be. But should you immediately cast it aside because it's something that you don't do? There's a lot of things in this world that people do that you don't do, right? And so the reality of it is that this practice of dying the eggs started with something extremely grotesque and murderous. Now then you had the Egyptians who hung decorative eggs in the temple, and then the Romans used decorative eggs, right, to honor Mother Goddess, right? And so all throughout different cultures, you had this egg piece. And even in the Middle Ages, in the Middle Ages in Europe, the Europeans collected different colored bird eggs from the nest, and they used them as charms to fight against evil and to bring good fortune. And later, the painting of eggs became popular, right? And this is where you get the Easter basket because the basket represents the bird nest, right? And so all of these things you should know if you're going to pass it along and get so excited and get dressed up for all of this, you need to be knowing what you're getting dressed up for. And the Easter bunny, right? Why is that? Because the rabbit uh, it's all been recognized as a symbol of fertility, right? And that's traced back all the way back to Queen Samarius. And in the 1500s in Germany, uh, some people believed that bunnies uh, laid red eggs on Holy Thursday and multicolored eggs the night before Easter Sunday. See all of this imaginative, uh, uh, ritualistic thinking, right? And then that, that went on to be customized and evolved in the edible Easter bunny eggs made out of sugar paste, uh, pastries. And then the tradition came to America in the 1700s with the Pennsylvania Dutch who immigrated from Germany. And the, and the pastry eggs, I mean, uh, uh, bad bunnies, uh, transformed into chocolate Easter bunnies. Right? And so this is, and this is how this goes. And so what is, what is the lesson in all of this? There's a lot of danger following things blindly, right? Or having a herd mentality. Because having a herd mentality and follow, following things blindly are of great concern, right? How often does the scripture speak of light and dark, right? How often do we hear of the blind man or woman being able to see in the Bible? We hear, we hear these enough to know that there's something important about blind being able to see, about the light and the dark. Because can a blind person tell if it is light or dark? No. Right? So it's important for us to realize that society is not your friend. It has never done anything to truly help them. All roles in society have led to slavery of the mind, which brings with it the body and a corrupted spirit. And when you know the truth and you ignore the truth, it shows and demonstrates the lack of discipline. It shows and demonstrates the lack. It shows and demonstrates laziness and cowardice in your life. You have to ask yourself the question, do you want to be seen as a doormat or a doorway in your life? Because if you're just sitting here listening and taking traditional and traditions and living them and, 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 and passing them on to your children blindly, then you are not only making yourself a doormat, but you are breeding this type of mentality in your children as well. Instead of teaching them to question all things. And most of us don't do that because we don't want our children to question us. Because a lot of times we don't have the answers to why. But that should make you step up your game in your life. You should start 
no longer just accepting these holidays and these traditions for what they appear to be. But do your research, and when it gets grotesque, or it seems to be something that touches you, and you say, man, that's, it just can't be like that. Well, why couldn't it be? Why couldn't it be? Because the person or the, or the society that's telling you has always taken care of you and they never lie to you. No, it's the exact opposite. The society continues to lie to you each and every day. Unimaginable perversion is happening all the time. It used to be private, but now you can turn on that so you can see perversion. You can see things being corrupted. Life, love being corrupted, but yet you believe that the traditions that you've been given are holy, that they're right and just. We have to start questioning every single thing. If you truly want to break out of bondage, if you want to truly escape Egypt, right, then you have to remove the unleavened things, I mean, the leavened things within your life, right? The thing about the unleavened versus the leavened bread, which is also very interesting, is that the leavened bread <clears throat> doesn't hold as long. The unleavened bread keeps longer. And so it's just like the truth. When you remove those things that are false, that truth will stay with you for a very long time. It is something that you can rely on along your journey. You must go with things that are true and proven. Stop allowing tradition uh, to, to, to dictate your life and your actions and stop being so um, ignorant and, and uh, argumentative when someone challenges you on what you have believed your entire life. It may hurt you and it may not feel good because you did it and it may feel lonely because you know if you give up that then you can no longer be around the masses in a certain way. Maybe you can't eat dinner the way you used to with your family. Maybe they don't love you the same way. You fear the rejection. You fear being having backs being turned upon you. But prepare yourself, uh, grow yourself, so when they ask you the question why, you can show and prove to them why you've chosen not to do the things that you know you're not supposed to be doing. And it's like if you say you are a righteous person, a person of truth. All right? We pray that this topic has been edifying to you. We now have our uh, affirmation for Brother Ferguson. Today's affirmation is entitled, Free, Here and Now, I Set Myself Free, to Tear Down the Walls of Societal Complacency and Norms. I accept the understanding that I am more than I believe. I am divinely created, and it is time for me to embrace it. I break the chains from my mind and free myself from bondage, welcoming new sight, sound, and understanding. Allow myself to live a new life according to the design of my creator, to live in truth and honor, and never sway into the ways of the world, nor accepting crippling doubt and owning half truths. For I have the clarity to know how to move forward and the ability to discern falsehood. I am making the choices that align to my highest good. I will live authentically and genuinely and hold morals and values high. I affirm that I am ready to take up new understandings in my life and all the endless blessings that will come, for I am free. Forever bright, forever true. Let us pray. Our Father, which are in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debt to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Shema, Israel, Adonai, Eleheim, Adonai, Ehud.